All right, this you ready? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. This is rocking with Jam Man. It was Dave David Elson. So, so what's up, man? Oh, I am uh, working hard. I'm mixing an album. I'm working on a Megadeth album. I'm doing some interviews, and enjoying your awesome photos on your wall right there behind you. All Thanks. my buddies there. Yeah, my dad took them. All, every single one. You, you know. Nice. I, I, he's, he's done a good job <laughs> very well. So when the world slows down because of the pandemic, you got, you picked right into high gear, didn't you guys? I did. I did. Yeah. I mean, for me, we're getting ready to go on a new, on a big Megadeth tour. We had just come home from Europe, uh, Megadeth and Five Finger Death Punch and, uh, Bad Wolves tour, um, which was great. It was a big sold out sports arena tour. So we were preparing to go to Mexico after that. And then Megadeth Lamb of God was going to go out and take over America. And then of course the pandemic hit. <laughs> so that shut it down. But, you know, the first thing we did is we got into action with the David Ellison Youth Music Foundation. Um, and we started giving some free music lessons, me and some of my friends like, uh, uh, Nita Strauss, Chris Kale, Bumblefoot, <clears throat> Dirk Ruburum, and a few others, um, Kiko, uh, Luriero. Uh, and we started giving some free music lessons to people around the world because schools were shutting down and everybody's at home. And we thought, look, let's, let's keep everybody engaged in music and keep, keep, you know, let's keep our nose up. Let's stay positive through all this, you know? So that was really, really great. Um, and then those, then we did some live streams that were supported by the Grammy Music Education Coalition, and you know that that just kind of kept us all connected. I felt like we were right away. We kind of put our arms around our community to keep everybody connected. It's like, hey, let's not get negative and you know, kind of sit off in the corner by ourselves. And you know, it's easy to be alone in your head and get all bummed out with everything that was going on. Um, and then that led to. Um, you know, my, my solo band, Ellison, we made this uh, no cover record, which is uh, 18 songs, actually 19 songs of um, cover songs. And because we had just been talking to everybody on our live streams, we started calling people up like Charlie Benante and Jason McMaster and um, the guys from Tesla and a bunch of people and said, hey, do you want to jump in and jam on jam on a cover song with us so and everybody was up for doing it um one of the fun ones was getting my friend l jorgensen from ministry uh getting to finally do something with him been good friends with him now for a few years and certainly a big fan of his band so it was really um that was a really awesome musical collaboration doing that cd and um so yeah i, I feel good about it we we and I, I wrote a book i finished my book rockstar hitman um, that I have, well, where is it? I got it right here. This little ditty right here, my first little fictional novel that I wrote. So I got that done. And, um, you know, I feel like we had a productive year, you know, despite, you know, despite the pandemic and some, some obstacles. Yeah, definitely. From recording the new uh, Megadeth album, Making Jewelry with uh, Strong, doing a side project with Jeff Scott Soto, putting out a horror movie dwellers, putting out your fictional book, rock star hitman, setting up a solo tour and hopefully a mega death tour this summer. Cross fingers. Yes. Yeah. I'd say there is no rest. There is no rest for the wicked. No, there is. And there's no rest for the blessed too. <laughs> right. That, that's how I look at it. You know, <laughs> when you're blessed with a talent um, and a skill um, that, that the good Lord provided me with and, and just as much blessed with friends and some incredible musicians uh, and artists around me. Um, why sit around and squander that, you know, is how I look at it. My thing is, you know, let's, let's get together, man. Let's, 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 call, let's call a play date, right? You know, meaning a play date. <laughs> let's get together and jam, let's play. Cause they call it playing music. It's not working music. And then, you know, for a lot of us, it's a profession, it's a career, it's how we make our living and everything. But, you know, it's, I, I never looked at music as work. You know, it's never been a job, um, even though, you know, my pay stub of my check may say that it's a job. To me, in my heart, it's never a job. To me, it's my heart. It's always it's always about just how cool is this we get to make music, you know, like you and me right now. How cool is it we get to just hang out and talk about music and hang around rock stars and like, 
how awesome is this? Like, I can't think of a better life. You know, this is, this is what we're born on, put on the planet to do. Yeah. That's music industry for you. Yep. When you have so many things to promote, how did you decide where to put it, your focus on? Good question. Very, very good question, actually. Um, you know, look, obviously when, uh, <clears throat> when Megadeth ramps up and we're working, you know, I, I carve all the space for that because, you know, that it's big and it takes a lot of bandwidth and it's it gets all the attention as it should. You know, we've worked uh, almost 40 years on that band um, and it's, you know, just a beautiful place and, and the fans are excited about it. So that, I put all my attentions there um, in a, you know, in a down season like we've been in. And of course, Megadeth is, you know, we've we've done dates every year. We've gone out and done done about eight weeks, 10 weeks or so of shows. Uh, since we kind of technically ended the dystopia tour in late 2017. Um, truth of it is, I think Megadeth now at this point, you know, the tour never ends. Now we're just kind of perpetually always on tour uh, to the sense that um, the phone rings and people want us to go be part of stuff. You know, they want us to go perform and that's a beautiful place for a band to be, you know, um, it's uh you know, it's, it's cool. But in, but with that said, you know, like a year, like 2020, for instance, um, you know, I had the book, uh, Drew and I knew the movie dwellers was going to be, uh, ready to tee that up and get that ready to promote. Um, and you know, even the no cover record, I originally was working on an album of original material with the Allison band. And when the pandemic hit, we thought, you know, look, let's just, let's do some covers. That's going to be a lot easier. It'll be fun. Um, we won't have to go on tour necessarily to promote it. So we can just put it out and, and people can, you know, have, have a, I kind of look like no cover record is kind of like the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, like we ended 2020 strong, you know, despite all the challenges, I felt like it's like, Hey, we got a great collection of songs with all of our friends on it. Um, I wanted to put the book out by Christmas time because I wanted it to be a kind of stocking stuffer, if you will, kind of a holiday gift for Christmas. And then um, I cleared the path. I knew in February we wanted to start promoting Dwellers because the movie Dwellers, because we got invited to go to the Mad Monster Horror Convention in uh, North Carolina. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So I wanted to make space for that. And then, um, you know, kind of unexpectedly, uh, I started working with Jeff Scott Soto, you know, on, on tracks that actually just was kind of a nice unexpected thing that landed in our, both of our laps back in January. And um, so we started working on that and, you know, um, by, I don't know, March, we felt like, Hey, we've got a, we've got an album shaping up here. Let's, let's put a song out. So we put out swords and tequila and just kind of as a way to sort of celebrate, uh, Hey, look at, here's a thing we're working on. And, you know, stay tuned for more. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the schedule kind of, you sort of have to be intuitive about it, you know, um, and also be a little flexible, you know, look, I, for two years now, I've had a Megadeth tour on my calendar and hopefully this year it'll actually happen to some degree. Um, uh, obviously the pandemic calls the shots right now, you know, and so to the degree that uh, we can do the tour or some of it, hopefully all of it, um is is kind of you know beyond our it's beyond our control so instead of sit at home and go oh man the tour canceled now i don't have anything going on <laughs> i figure look we know that it's all kind of up in the air so let me do what i you know sort of you know give me the courage to change the things i can and what i can change is i can sit here and create you know i can write songs i can write books i can promote the movie um, and I can, I can be productive and do things, um, even when some of the other things are still up in the air and unknown yet. Uh, you were involved with two of the nicest guys in the music industry, Bumblefoot and Jeff Scott Soto. They're the nicest guys. They're good people. Those two. I know. I I would agree. Those two are stand up gentlemen. I love them both. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're coming up with, on the uh, 40th anniversary of the start of Megadeth. When mm -hmm. you first started out, did you ever think you would reach the levels that you did? Um, at the risk of sounding arrogant, and I don't mean it to sound like this, uh, I did. <laughs> um, and I say that because, um, how old are you, by the way? I am 10. 
You're 10. Okay. So when I was 11 years old, so I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. I rode the school bus every morning, me and my brother to go to school for about an hour. We got picked up at 715, got dropped off at school by 815. School started at 830 in the morning, right? And um, one year we had a bus driver who had long hair. He was, he was our pastor's son, actually, from our church. And he drove the school bus and he liked rock and roll. And so he uh, would always listen to a station out of Chicago called WLS AM, it was an AM station. And I started hearing things like Chicago, 10CC, uh, Sticks, <clears throat> um, Bachman Turner Overdrive, Kiss, uh, Sweet, you know, these different, all these like cool bands, right? And uh, very guitar driven bands. And I fell in love with that sound and rock and roll. Um, and that for me got me excited about music. So I picked up the bass at age 11. I'd already played the tenor saxophone. I'd taken piano lessons. So I was somewhat musically educated <clears throat> at a young age. And, but the bass made me want to go be a rock star. You know, that was a whole other level, especially when I saw like Kiss Destroyer and Kiss Alive. I'm like, come on, who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, you know, they, the Kiss was to me, what the Beatles were to kiss, <laughs> you know what I mean? And the Beatles were to so many, to many bands. Um, and, um, you know, so for me, that was the thing that got me excited about, about music, you know? And uh, I started, as soon as I got my bass, I practiced and I tried to find other musicians who thought the same as I did and listened to the same kind of music as I did. And so we started putting bands together and, you know, and, when I moved to LA in 1983, I'd been gigging around the Midwest and, and uh, I knew how to be in a band. I knew how to put bands together. I knew how to book them and, you know, do all the stuff. And so when I got to LA, I meet Dave Mustaine about a couple of times, well, within a week after getting there, uh, within a few days actually. And, um, and I knew when I met him, um, you know, he, I could tell he, he, he was destined for success. And I felt the same way about me. You know, because when I got that bass in my hand at age 11, I didn't think about anything else. That was it. I had a single focus and that's all I did. It's all I thought about. Um, everything that came into my life was second to that dream and that passion. And, um, you know, I, I just, I followed it just, and, and it led me to LA. I meet Dave. He thinks the same like I do. We're both very driven. We're both dedicated. And, um, you know, uh, off we go, <laughs> you know? So, and that was like you say, almost four years ago now. So um, I could tell Megadeth was going to be a big band as we were putting it together. I could feel it. I, I sensed that people loved what we were doing. They were drawn to it. They, um, people liked the music we were writing, you know, when we would be at rehearsal venues and stuff and rehearsing people would go, oh, man, those songs are awesome. So, um, I, I say that I, I knew it was going to be big, um, but I also knew it was not going to be easy. And I knew it was going to be a lot of hard work. And, um, you know, that's the other part of this is that our job is to make it look really easy and look fun on the stage. That's our job, right? Is to just take the audience away and forget about life and just get lost in our music. But behind it is a lot of work, years and years and years, and in our case, decades of hard work. Um, so uh, the hardest part, I think, is probably first finding the people to put the band together. The second part is keeping it together. And uh, I'd say, if anything, that's one of the things that Megadeth should be rewarded for as much as anything, is just actually keeping it together, um, despite a lot of obstacles that we've had along the way as well. Uh, it's just crazy to think that you guys can be played on the classic rock stations now. Have you ever heard yourself on the oldie station yet? <laughs> I have not. That's a good question, but I think that's where we're going next is the oldie station. You know, it's fun. I, I thought the same thing because to me, classic rock was like, you know, Eric Clapton and, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, you know, um, Carly Simon, you know, to me, that was classic rock music. Um, and, um, you know, then one day I realized, oh, my God, Megadeth and Metallica and Iron Maiden, like we're classic rock, you know, Ozzy, Black Sabbath. I listened to Ozzy's Boneyard on Sirius XM on the satellite station here in America. 
And, um, you know, I hear our songs, I hear uh, Black Sabbath, you know, and our generation and our genre of music, that's what it is now. It's, it's, become, it's become classic. And now it doesn't feel like old guy music, you know, it feels like, it feels like it's a classic. And that's actually, I think, a, a nice compliment. Uh, now, now when Dave uh, left Metallica, he said he wanted to form a band to play harder and faster than them. Yeah. Throughout your career, has there ever been a rivalry between the two bands? I mean, have you, even if you guys are cool with each other, is there something in the back of your head? There's always a rivalry between bands at some point. You know, they call it a battle of the bands for a reason, you know, in high school and grade school. It's like they have a battle of the bands. In fact, I remember as a kid, um, probably, you know, at nine, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I mean, 12, 13, maybe. I remember reading a, a, a book called Rockstar. And it was about a guy like me, um, maybe like you, um, a young, young man who had to dream of being a rock star and there was a battle of the bands at his uh, high school and um i think he won the battle of the bands and it's so funny you know behind me you see the big four platinum records and this stuff the big four is just a battle of the bands you know it's just high school just on a on a bigger stage you know and um i think when you're starting your band it's always competitive because it's kind of you know survival of the fittest you know, who's going to, who's going to make the cut, you know, who's going to last, who's going to, who's going to get the tour, who's going to get the big record deal, who's going to make the most money, who's going to get the platinum record, whatever, right? There's all these sort of benchmarks by which we measure our success. But I think by the time we did the big four, um, uh, back in, you know, 2010 and 11, by that point, we'd all been to the top of the mountain. You know, we'd all been, we'd gotten our Grammy nominations and gold and platinum records, and we'd been on all the big tours and headlined ourselves and done all these things. And so by the time we did that, that was really coming together more like a family reunion, you know, kind of checking in with each other, like, hey, how you been, man? Hey, how's the kids? You know, uh, you know, how's the house doing? Oh, you bought a new house. Oh, where'd you move? You know, so it was like very adult conversations, you know, and it wasn't any more about competition of like, dude, I'm going to play faster than you and I need to be harder and heavier, you know, because those, those are sort of younger ambitions. And, and you're right. I mean, when Dave came up with that mission statement for Megadeth, um, you know, we had, we had the whole world in front of us and uh, we had a lot of work to do. And we had a couple of big, some big bands around us, Metallica, Slayer, uh, Anthrax, uh, as well as Motley Crue and Rat and Quiet Riot and everything else that was going on. So finding your place in that, um, you have to have a purpose and you have to be dedicated to your mission, which we definitely were in Megadeth. Writing this new album, did, did you feel pressured? I mean, you guys are known for hit records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's pressure. I mean, I think there's pressure after every record because um, you want it to be as good or better um than you know the one or ones before it um and in our case dystopia was a big record for us you know we won a grammy um it was a very much a fan favorite record across the board all around the world um the critics loved it um it really repositioned megadeth in a really good way um when that record came out so um we and we want to maintain that obviously we want to maintain that and we want to go beyond that. You know, we want to we do that. Now, Megadeth, we have records that are really thrashing and fast. We've got records that are very melodic, um, big songs that were played on the radio. They work very well when we play the big arenas and stadiums and everybody knows them. They can sing along to them. And then we've got some things that we've explored and we went to, you know, tried some different things. So, um, I think every time we make a Megadeth record now, it's going to naturally include all of that. It's going to thrash. It's going to have some melody. It's going to hope we have some songs that everybody can sing along to. Um, and also things that really feature the musicians, you know, feature the performances and the players. So, um, yeah, there's pressure, <laughs> you know. What's your uh, Christian beliefs? 
are there any times when you hear the lyrics and like, man, I can't be a part of this, man. This is too, yeah, this is not my, I can't. No, not really. I mean, not in any of the stuff that I'm involved in. Um, you know, and, and again, I grew up a, a Protestant Lutheran kid. Um, it was, I'm not of the sort of, um, um, certainly not Pentecostal. Um, and I'm not sort of of the kind of born again, you know, um, church revival movements. It's not been my thing. Um, you know, for me, when I got, um, when I stopped taking drugs and drinking and all that stuff back in 1990, right before we recorded the Rust in Peace album, you know, that was kind of a big lifestyle change for me as far as just not being around um, things that, 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 so I could, so I could stay clean, you know, and fortunately our whole band was um, of the mindset that, Hey, we need to really pull together and we really need to have each other's back. And, um, and, and really, you know, in order to make this work and, and we did. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the truth of it is, is, you know, everybody has their own beliefs. Some people are vegans. Uh, some people are of a certain political um, belief. And I think the main thing is, is to kind of live and let live, you know, let people have their beliefs, let them be who they are. You know, that's who they are. Um, you don't have to change them. It, it's okay to disagree with some things. You don't have to fight over it, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, at the end of the day, why are we, why are we in a band together, whether it's Megadeth or anything else that I do, it's to make great music and play these songs that, that we wrote. Um, and that, that's the reason we're there. So all the other stuff, you know, is all kind of, it's very secondary, you know, whether it's of a spiritual belief, a political belief, a, a nutrition belief, it's all, eh, that's all, we kind of leave all that stuff off the stage, you know? How is your uh, relationship with Dave? I mean, usually when someone puts a brand and sues them and the public fighting, there's no coming back from that. Right. I, I agree. I, I totally agree. I think Dave and I are both very thankful. We're very grateful that um, we were able to, uh, you know, make amends and, and just, you know, uh, overcome that because you're right. Most don't. It's kind of once that's dead, that's you're done and out. Um, I think, you know, between Dave and I, there is a genuine brotherly love between us um, just as, as brothers and, um, um, in a way, maybe we're kind of brothers we didn't have ourselves. Dave grew up with the sisters. I, I did have an older brother, but um, he stayed behind to run the farm. And when I moved out to L.A., Dave kind of became an older brother to me to help me kind of learn the streets and learn how to live in L.A. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, Dave and I share a lot of history, you know, before wives, families, you know, anything that we have in our lives today, there was me and Dave. <laughs> you know, we were before all of that, you know. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, it, it's, uh, we, we can always go back to that. I mean, you know, people are amazed Chris Adler when he was cutting the dystopia record and certainly Kiko and even Dirk, you know, when people sit in a room and they hear me and Dave share stories about things and we can almost finish each other's sentences sometimes, you know, cause we kind of know what each other's going to say. Um, you know, that is the true heart and soul of a friendship. And, uh, you know, two friends aren't always going to agree on everything. You're not always going to, you know, get along on every single matter. And again, kind of what I said earlier, it's okay to agree to disagree. Dave actually had a great quote one time. He said, he goes, hey, if me and David agree on everything, one of us is unnecessary, you know? So sometimes the fact that you can agree to disagree and you can have different opinions, that's what makes it colorful. You know, that's what, that's what pushes each other. It's what, it's what helps keep each other in check. And, um, and I'd like to think it's, it's made both of us better over the years. So would you say you guys are like a married couple who got it, who had a bad divorce, but still love each other and eventually <laughs> married again? That's, pro that's probably the closest, the closest, uh, you know, similarity you could draw to it. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I mean, look, you can think about certain people in your life, right? And, and even sometimes it's like, you know, you can love them, you don't always like them, you know, and that may be your spouse, it may be even your children, it could be, you know, your best friend, it's like, I love you, bro, 
but I really don't like what you're doing right now. Yeah. And you're pissing me off, you know, and uh, that's, that's okay. Again, we don't, we don't always have to see eye to eye on things, but it also doesn't mean that you then just discount them and cut them out of your life either. It's like, all right, we're going through a little rough patch right now, you know, and in bands, it's very different than, than a lot of other uh, friendships um, in that, you know, we spend many hours, many, many days, weeks, months living as i call it in the yellow submarine as the beatles called it you know we're kind of in a you know in a tube we're in, in a bus we're in an airplane we're driving in a van to and from an airport or a venue i mean there's just a lot of time we spend together and um um you know we have you know we we we, we get to you know be around each other through a lot of different things you know kids are born kids going to school buying and selling houses um, some people go through personal problems and financial difficulties and, you know, and we're there for each other with all that stuff. And that, you don't usually get that at most jobs, you know, most jobs, you kind of come in, you sit at your desk, you do your work, and then you go home and you get to leave the office behind here. You go back to the, you know, you go home, which is your hotel room. And, um, you know, you just got done playing a gig and next thing you know, you're going out to dinner, <laughs> you know, now you're hanging out again. So you got a big part of being in the band is, can you hang out with each other? I mean, that really is, that's 90% of it, you know, is, is, can you hang out? Yeah. Can you make great music, but also can you just, can you bro down and hang out with each other? Nowadays, fans uh, feel like they do not have to pay for music. Does that bother you when you have to do, uh, make a new album? I mean, come on, on this. You make a living about it. You make a living. You got to at least pay for it because of the touring. It's like really hard to get shows. So you got to pay for the music. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you make a good point. I mean, look, music has always been something we pay for. You know, when I went in as a kid to buy albums, cassettes, whatever, um, you know, we, we buy it. In the same way as you buy a cup of coffee, you go to the hardware store, you buy a hammer, you buy a screwdriver, you know you buy groceries, you know, you don't just get to suddenly take them home for free. They, there's a, there's a cost to them. Um, and you're right. The, the, you know, everybody I can, like, Oh, well, those guys are rich. They can afford to give us their music. <laughs> well, that, that, that still doesn't change the point of it's it was not yours to just take. If I give it to you, if I say, Hey, come to my website, there's a free download. It's yours to have. Hey, then by all means have it, take it. Um, but, um, I think it's mostly changed. I think the streaming services, um, where music is, you no, know, it's not free cause you're paying for it somewhere. Um, you know, somebody's, somebody's paying for it. You're, you're, you have to sit through an annoying ad on YouTube or something before you get to hear your favorite song. Um, and then sometimes people go, all right, I'm just going to pay for it. So I don't have to hear these ads, you know? So again, you're kind of paying for music. Um, you know, we've figured it out. It's better now than, than it was, uh, some years back. But, um, as you said, there, there's costs to making it, you know, the producer doesn't have to, shouldn't have to work for free. The studio costs money. Um, it takes time to be in a room and write the songs. And, you know, there's, there's a process, there's a production kind of like this house, you know, that I'm in and that you're in, it took somebody some time to build it, you know, plus there's the cost of the wood and the floor and the ceiling and, you know, the stuff isn't free. It, it, it costs, it costs something, you know? So it's, you, you know, when you, when you, you know, music is kind of weird because you can't sort of touch it. It's not like you can touch a song, you know what I mean? It's, it's, and that's, what's kind of interesting about copyright law is copyright is sort of putting legal protection and parameters around something you can't see and touch, right? <laughs> but yet you can hear it and it, and it, changes your life even right because of, of how it sounds and um, so you know we're I, I i think it's better now than it than it's been in years past let me just kind of leave it there how about that with a band as big as megadeth do you think more with merch or putting out music Maybe. uh both of them both of them um you know merchandising is obviously huge it, it's it's obviously a um financially beneficial of course but you know i think the main thing is is why do you make merch well i want people to walk around with my name or band name on their shirt because their body kind of becomes like sort of a walking advertisement every 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 person is kind of a walking billboard to sort of advertise right whether you're you know 
wearing a rock and roll t-shirt or someone says a polo golf shirt or a woman has her Lululemon yoga pants on, whatever it is, you know, um, it's, it's sort of an advertisement and, you know, clothing companies figured this out years ago. That's why they put their label and their name on their, on their products, you know? Um, so, you know, more than anything, I just like seeing Megadeth shirts out there. You know, it's cool to see, uh, you go to the bank or you're at Starbucks or something and you look over and there's some dude or some girl over there with her Megadeth shirt on or jacket or something. It's kind of like, yeah, you're part of the tribe. You know, we, we can hang out, you know? Yeah. We can hang out, man. We can hang out. Yeah. Can you give, can you, uh, can you give off the new album song? Is this the new song title? One of some new album. I can't. Uh, and for a couple of reasons, one, obviously it's confidential until it comes out. But the other reason is, is me and Dave had a saying many years ago, it's never final until it's on vinyl. Meaning that until that record comes out, everything can change. The songs might change. The title might change. We might change a word. We might change a guitar riff, you know, so everything's kind of a work in progress until it's done and it actually comes out and it's sitting in your hands on your turntable. Do you plan on dropping a single or two before the album? <laughs> Usually we do. Um, I don't know for sure what the strategy will be on this record yet, partly because we're hoping the tour happens and, you know, making plans um, in a pandemic uh, around, uh, the, you know, the world to open up is, is the first order of business. And once we know that, then we can concentrate on getting the record out. Um, if you look at dystopia, you know, we put our first song we put out was fatal illusion. And then we put out, uh, the threat is real. And that was in, uh, late 2015. And then in uh, 2015, we released the album. So the typical model is that you put a single or two out before the album. Uh, how do my followers start following you? Um, they can, you can uh, you can find about about all your projects and tour dates and stuff like that, correct? Yep. yep. Go to davidellison.com is where all my personal stuff is. Megadeth.com is where all the Megadeth activity and the summer tour and dates and stuff is over there for that. And they can get all the cool merch there and everything else. Yep. All the stuff there. For me personally, you can go to ellisonmerch.com. Uh, we have a merch store over there where you can buy Ellison coffee. You can get t-shirts, swag, stuff. Um, my book and even signature stage used bases and things like that, you can go to uh, ellisonstore.com to get the book. And uh, so those are the places where the merch is i do unboxings on my show if you want to hook a brother up for what for for a book yeah for a book or anything you can give me anything you, if you... <laughs> i can hook a brother up we'll we'll make that happen i'll, I'll have I'll, I'll have my publicist to contact your publicist and we'll make it happen with slayer calling it quits did you ever think there's time where you decided to hang it up and if and if so will it be neg a megadeth or that stops first you know i have not seen in my mind megadeth stopping uh we kind of um unplanned disband disbanded for a couple years 2002 until 2004 um but uh you know, I, I, you know, look, we play a very aggressive kind of music. It, it's hard on your body. <laughs> um, it's a lot of notes. It's a lot of energy. It, it takes a certain, you know, um, youthful vitality and energy about yourself in order to, to perform it. Um, so with that, <clears throat> um, you know, I guess, look, if there's comes a point in time where we just physically can't play this stuff anymore, then I guess maybe it would be best to hang it up rather than you know go go out sounding badly um but you know for now we we're young at heart uh we're in good physical shape and uh, as long as we can keep playing these songs and as long as our audience wants to hear it i think some way shape or form there will i hope always be a megadeth i'm eating 
in 40 years, will uh, we will have a, a Dave a Dave Mustang or an Axel Rose or an Ozzy or a Lemmy? Are there any icons out there now who will be there for me to play for my grandkids? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. You know, you you could put Slash in there, of course. You know, you've got your friend Randy Blythe back there. He's he's one of them. Um, you know, uh, new people coming up the ranks, um, they seem to all be on TikTok <laughs> for some reason. So, um, you know, there's, there's always some new hero coming up the ranks. Um, they look different, they sound different, and that's why they become heroes because they're, they think different than everybody else, you know? Um, so um, for now, I think we just kind of have to he keep our ear to the ground. I kind of think maybe after this pandemic, there might be some really interesting music and maybe some interesting new artists coming out uh, in the next couple of years to follow as well. Um, what is it going to be like backstage now with being sober for 30 years and Dave recovering with his health? You know, it's, you know, look, it's, it's rock and roll um people hang out we don't tell people they can't drink and they can't do all that kind of stuff look they're there to bits of it's a it's a rock concert you know people are there to hang out and have fun and do their thing um <clears throat> you know for me not drinking um and drawing a sober breath that's up to me you know that has nothing to do with what anyone else wants to do um that's just about me not participating in that and um to any of your young viewers um you know, we don't ever need to feel the pressure to do something we don't want to do or go into a direction we don't want to go. Um, we can be perfectly comfortable with who we are. And um, if that means not drinking or being part of that, yet wanting to hang out with the party, if you, if you can do it without messing your life up, by all means, do it. <laughs> you know, so uh, it kind of comes to your own personal convictions, I think. Uh, what is it like playing for the ten thousand, the tens of thousands with Megadeth doing twelve clubs on your own? You know, it. They're both great. Um, you know, with Megadeth, we've come to sort of expect that that it's going to be at that size, and it's great. In fact, look, Megadeth was just a little club band at one time too. You know, so the fact that we got up to the arenas and we got to play these big shows, um, festivals, and things is great. It's all. It's always fun. You know. Um, and, uh, you know, then to go out and um, for me personally, I'll go out and do solo shows, which I you know, intend them to be smaller um, and don't have any expectations for them to be other than that. Um, I enjoy those because they are these intimate moments uh, where I get to kind of look people in the eyeballs and, and it, it becomes a much more personal experience because I can, I can let it be that. Megadeth is big and we try to keep it big. You know, that was the intention was to get it to that size. Uh, well, thank you for being on my show, man. I hope the next time we talk is at the backstage and one yourselves. I probably will be, Jam, man. Thank you, buddy. Good thank hanging you, with you. Man. Have a great night. You, dude. Bye.